next uh, speaker, which should be David. And do we have David? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm, I'm uh, there we go. Let's get hey, we can hear you and see you, so welcome. So David is an undergraduate electrical engineering student at the Portland State University in Oregon. And at Portland State, he has been a core member of the electronics team with Oresat and working on the milliwatt scale power electronics and embedded hardware systems. And he's going to give us an overview of the electrical power system. Um, so David, if you're ready, take it away. Uh, great, thank you. So yeah, just kind of to, to take it back real quick to what Andrew had said earlier, um, a lot of the requirements that were influencing the power, uh, the design of the power system specifically, is we wanted scalable design, it had to all be cheap, it had to be open source, obviously, and it had to work specifically in a, a student learning environment, which has a lot of unique system engineering problems. Um, so kind of how we took those requirements uh, and how that influenced the design philosophy of what we were working with, is we decided the best way to create something for the educational space was to provide a series of, of proven design modules that had been tested and we knew they worked and were reliable and uh, for the power systems what those modules look like is we have a, a battery card uh, we have a solar module and then we also have something called the orset power domain which we'll talk a little bit more about later um, what this leads to is it's a bit more of a distributed electrical power system. It's not like we have a card that is the, the electrical power card that does all the voltage regulation, the batteries and the PowerPoint track and all that. It's kind of all over the place. Um, it's distributed among multiple systems. And uh, this is good because it gives us a lot of modularity and a lot of uh, flexibility in how we actually configure an ORSAT. Um, uh, but one of the problems with that is, is it leads to a lot more of a complex system architecture, which can be a lot harder to understand at a system design level. Uh, and then Andrew had talked about, had touched on this, but when we're looking at our backplane just from a power perspective, uh, it's pretty boring. There isn't a whole lot actually going on on the backplane. The power that we route through it is the actual battery voltage itself, so 7.2 nominal. Um, we have the ORSAT power domain, the data connections that are, are traveling as part of that is we have a fault tolerant I squared C line as well as a low power 3.3 volt rail as well as the actual the the satellite shutdown signal which is part of the inhibit switches and the remove, remove before flight getting into the actual the, the the power subsystems themselves so we have the here we have a battery card which is actually two independent uh, 2S lithium ion packs on a single card, and those are two independent packs in parallel. They're, it's kind of 2S, 2P, but also it's it's not because each pack has its own battery management system um, independent from each other for redundancy. Uh, so each of the packs are independent. You get about 37.5 watt hours per battery card, uh, and they really are. They're just boring 18650s. Nothing special about them other than the ones we use are UL listed and, and uh, rated for, for air, air freight. Um, each card has the, uh, the embedded battery management system on board. We have the inhibit switches, which are ISS compliant, uh, which is uh, a step outside of the uh, regular CDS, I believe. Um, and then, uh, as Hayden and Marvin talked about, we have the integrated thermal insulation. We also have capped on heaters on board. Uh, going into a little bit more detail, I'm, I'm sorry this is such small print for the, the schematic here, but we have the overcharge and over discharge protection. And how we do that is we use uh, a, some chips from ABLIC, the S8209s. And what those do is they have a hardware defined charge and discharge cutoff. So that's actually like part of the silicon. Uh, it's not programmable, which is nice because you don't have to worry about like a single event just flipping a bit and suddenly your your cutoff is at five volts instead of 4.2. Um, but you know you do have to order the specific SKU. Uh, as part of that though, is is these chips right here. There's actually a, a you can daisy chain them. So what we can do there is we can actually also add in a software defined cutoff through the onboard F09. 
So we can actually define outside of the hardware defined ones of the Ablet chips. We can basically cut this off at any time with these Ablet chips through the, the F09 um, for, for whatever reason. Moving on, we have our fuel gauge over here, the 17205 from Maxim. Uh, this chip in particular is an incredibly precise fuel gauge. Uh, it takes into account like your your uh, depth of discharge, the age of the cells, the temperature of the cells, all of that into the actual fuel gauge calculations, which is really nice. It does that all like internally itself. Um, it also has integrated temperature and current sense measurement sensors, uh, and it's reporting all of that back to the, the local microcontroller. Um, and that temperature that we're reading is, is also how we control the onboard Kapton heater. It also has um, a dedicated alert pin that you can actually program, which is really nice because this chip right here is incredibly low power. It's in the like tens of microamps range in terms of like active current draw. The So we can basically sleep the onboard microcontroller until it gets like an interrupt or something like that. So it's much more power efficient that way. Uh, so something we ran into is, is the our inhibit switch architecture. We uh, and what we actually we had to go back and redesign it. And what we have here is we have two mechanically and electrically independent inhibit switch uh, configurations. And what that does is we have these inhibit switches down here, which when they're inserted in the deployer, they're closed, they actually ground out a line that we call a uh, shutdown. And that's like our shutdown signal that goes in through the ablex and cuts off the batteries that way. We also have these uh, over here that they, this is in the power path of the batteries. So the, these physical switches are actually cutting off the batteries from the bus uh, me mechanically as well. Um, and uh, th this does actually meet the spec for uh, ISS deployed CubeSats, which is a step above what some other private uh, launch providers need, um, which is uh, it's nice to have a system that goes above and beyond there. As for the solar modules, so we have, it's one U each. As Andrew said, we get 2.34 uh, watts peak per module. So that's for two of the cells. That's also the theoretical peak. That's not with the maximum PowerPoint tracker. Um, we have an actual active MPPT. We're currently running a perturbant observe algorithm on that. We would like to move to or to some more efficient and modern ones later, but perturbant observe is boring and it's dumb and it just works. Um, as Marvin and Hayden said, it is also uh, directly connected to the frames thermally. Uh, and it's also where we insert our RBF tag. So that is actually where the RBF goes in and that also grounds out shutdown through the solar cell there. And talk a little bit more about the architecture of the solar cells here. Uh, so the way the, the the short of the control loop of the the maximum PowerPoint tracking, we have our voltage and current sensor coming in. Uh, it's reporting over I squared C uh, the measurements to the STM32, which is doing the maximum PowerPoint tracking calculations, and then we have this LT1618, which is a boost converter, um, and it is an adjustable boost converter. So the, the STM32 is actually applying an analog voltage and controlling uh, the output of this boost converter. And that's actually how we're setting the maximum power point is we're just controlling just a COTS boost converter IC. Um, and then that's going directly through an ideal diode for just for reverse biasing, but then uh, the uh, directly into the bus charging the batteries. Uh, so moving on from there, so the ORSAT power domain is is a what that is, is that that's not a specific card that is a design block that has to go into each uh each card that has to operate on its own and what that is is it's trying to provide a standard design uh like a standard interface for students to interact with the basically the control of the c3 so this is outside of the can bus this is just to turn on and off uh, basically to interact with the power systems. So a standard inter way to interface with the power systems, and it's also so we can isolate a single card uh, that so that like a single uh, payload or a single card cannot brick the entire satellite. It just can't pull the entire thing down. 
uh, and what the that OPD looks like, and this is going to be, again, this is on every card, is we have an I squared C interface that goes up and down the back plane that goes into, we have a, a GPIO expander. So this is how our C3, which is our main onboard computer, can monitor and control each of the card's power systems. So it can go in through this GPIO expander. It has the ability to uh, turn, basically cut the power to a card and just remove it entirely from the bus. Uh, it also, there is a fault line. So if the onboard circuit breaker detects a fault, it can read it through here. We also have an emergency I squared C bootloader, which is actually really funny because you have I squared C coming in here and then on the output of this uh, GPIO expander, you are bit banging I squared C over I squared C. So I, I call it I4C. Um, no one finds that as funny as I do, but I think it's hilarious. Uh, and this I squared C line is also fault tolerant. So I squared C in general is uh, very vulnerable to single event upsets. All it takes is a single uh, upset on one slave device can basically just pull the entire bus down. So what we did to help that, we have this comparator circuit design, which will essentially, if it senses that the bus has been pulled down low for too long, uh, it will actually cut the whole thing off from the bus, uh, the I squared C line off from the bus, and actually all the cards come off of the bus because that the whole bus is low for every card. And then the cards will slowly come back up and it will either the single event will be cleared because it we power cycled everything, or we will slowly come back up and we'll be able to figure out which one is the card that is dead and the one killing the bus, and we can turn that one off for good. So it, it's not perfect. There are some flaws with this problem, uh, with this design, but it's uh, better than nothing, and it's off the shelf parts, and it gets around using rad hard anything. So. Moving on from there, we actually also have the MAX4211, which is our current monitor, which we use as a circuit breaker. So essentially, we have the battery voltage coming in, and what this chip coming into the card, and what this chip is doing is it's looking at the current draw. If it detects a short, it will uh, cut, A, cut off the card from the the bus so it just it would turn it off and that sends a fault signal to the c3 uh it can also do that if it is just signaled directly by the c3 through that gpio expander we can tell this card to just cut itself off or uh it also can report the power draw to the local microcontroller uh power supplies that is kind of up to each system on their own. So each card handles its own voltage regulation. It allows the OPD to scale and kind of apply. Uh, it allows you to scale the voltage rails to whatever your card may need instead of running it directly through the entire satellite. Um, our reference designs, we like to use automotive rated switching power supplies from TI just because they're cheap and they're high frequency and efficient. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. That's kind of the beauty of this part of the system is it's isolated from everything else. So it really is up to whoever is designing the system to use a power supply that works for them. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for coming. So here at the end, here's all of our source files. Uh, you can contact me directly with any questions. There's my email or my LinkedIn, or you can feel free to contact ORSAT as a whole with the aerospace email. Uh, and thank you, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, David, and that was exactly on time. So thank you for being on time too. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, um, I can see some questions on the chat have been answered directly. Um, and there's another question. Uh, I can speak a bit about the future development uh, plans for uh, our set power systems. What's in store? Yeah, so uh, I think the one thing we're working on is we're working on a, a a 1.5U solar module, specifically because the going to 2U, you can just put two 1Us together, but you can't really do that with a, with a 1.5U. So we're debating if we should do a 1.5U or actually just stick with the 1Us on there. Um, as Andrew also briefly mentioned, we would really like to do uh, a silicon version of our solar module just because gallium arsenide cells are expensive and not everyone can afford them. And if your power budget would allow it, it's really nice to be able to get away with those. 
And can you uh, talk a bit about um, any considerations and challenges if someone would try to, to scale the power system as it is right now beyond 3Q? Yeah, so I, I, a lot of problems with that come with just the card cage system inherently is challenging scaling that to 6U. Um, in addition to that with the solar modules, so you could just kind of like tack them on just as, as the one use, uh, but you could also get uh, potentially get much more power and so much more efficiency out of just having like the full 6U side as a single module. Um, that's kind of, uh, there, there's a trade-off there because you are getting more power, but also it you have a very specialty module for one specific situation. And we kind of like having the flight heritage and the simplicity of just having one module like daisy chained along. So, you know, that that's something that we're kind of debating for what would happen if we scale it to 6U. And finally, if you can uh, speak a bit about the environmental considerations when when designing the overall power system. Yeah. Um, so I the the big thing that we did when we we did some testing with a um, a solar simulator, which was a very janked up halogen bulb, but that was part of the testing that we did for our maximum power point tracker because it also actually really heated up the modules to the point where it actually desoldered the modules from the board, which we were not expecting uh, and was terrifying because that was uh, very shortly before flight that that happened. But so, you know, heating it up, we've also did where uh, the batteries were also a big consideration in general for the, the thermal testing because there are on our mission, they're the most thermally sensitive component. Everything else can go way below zero degrees. So those are the things that are going to freeze first. So that was obviously the thing that we chucked in the freezer first to see and make sure that uh, that control loop was there with the heater and all of that. Um, we, we I would have liked to do a, a fair bit more testing on the solar modules in general, just because there's a whole lot of weirdness that happens with maximum power point drift and with temperature and with the different uh, degrees of illumination, but you know, uh, time time crunch as always. Oh, excellent! Um, and I think we are on time for our next talk. So thank you, David. Uh, thank for you, giving us the in-depth 